Hi everybody, my name is Richard Oberdyk and in this tutorial I'll be talking about the geometrical algorithm as a way to solve multiparametric linear and multiparametric quadratic programming problems. If you're watching this video I assume that you're already familiar with the general concept of multiparametric programming and that you have an understanding of the solution properties and uh, how the um, how the general um, situation let's say looks like. I also expect that you know what the basic sensitivity theorem is um, and what are KKT conditions and the like. So um, the idea is now to understand how can we solve MPLP and MPQP problems. Now in general the type of problem we're looking at is um, we're having here an optimization problem where we have a positive definite uh, matrix Q, our optimizers are X, we have our parameter theta and we have uh, affine constraints and we have a, a polytope as a parameter space. So our theta is bounded in the polytope. Okay? And the solution to this type of problem, as we all know, is this set is a set of polytopes that we call critical regions. And associated with each one of the polytopes, we have the optimal solution, um, x as a function of the parameter theta, the Lagrangian uh, multipliers as a function of theta, and the objective function as a function of theta. And the question that, that we're now asking is how can we solve this problem? So what can we do to be make sure that we get all the polytopes with all the solutions and everything? And th the general idea that we're following in the geometrical algorithm is like is, is as you might imagine to think geometrically. So what that means is let's look at the properties of the solution and based on that design an algorithm that get that, that helps us get the uh, solution of the entire MPLP and MPQP. Now in terms of properties what we know of the MPLP and MPQP is that the critical regions are disjoint. The only exception for that is of course when we have dual degeneracy in the case of MPLPs but there is another video dedicated to that and we know that their union is convex. Okay, So we have disjoint polytopes and their union is convex. And so the idea of the geometrical algorithm is let's use these facts to simply, let's say, explore the parameter space. That's actually a phrase that's oft used very often in, in, in papers until we found all the regions. And um, for us, luckily enough, the convexity of the union will actually keep us in check because we know that the union is convex, so we, we will always stop somewhere uh, reasonable. Um, this is important, uh, as we will see later on, for, for certain types of algorithms. And uh, the, the, the thing with this is if you combine all these things together, that's when we call it a geometrical algorithm. So whenever you use the fact that the critical regions are polytopes and you're exploring, you're moving from one polytope to another, then that's what we call a geometrical algorithm. Now. The rest of the video, I'm just going to explain to you several iterations of the geometrical algorithm. So, several different versions of how this interpretation was done. The first idea was that the one of reversal of the constraints, okay, and this was done by Ben Porat et al. and the Du et al. Okay, in 2000, 2002. And the basic idea is let's let's assume we have one critical region, okay, which we can get, for instance, by using the, uh, the basic sensitivity theorem or by solving the KKT conditions parametrically. It's your choice. So this is, this is your starting point. And based on this, you explore the rest of the parameter space. Remember, this is always what we want to do. By using this formula, and this is what I'm going to explain to you now what that means. What that means, and then this way we get the partitioning of the entire region. What that means is that at every for every constraint i of your critical region, okay, of this CR0, we reverse the ith constraint and we enforce all the constraints previously of i. So let's look at it from the example of this CR0, okay? Consider, for instance, this constraint, okay? We have our parameter space here and our i is 1, which means this doesn't matter because there is no j less than 1. So we only have, we rever rever reverse this constraint, which means that this constraint right here flips and we get this region right here, okay? Then we move to the next region, which means to the next constraint. And now this is the constraint number two. The constraint number one, now two, uh, the only constraint that is less than two is the first constraint, which is this one, and this has to hold. So instead, instead of going for only the parameter space theta, what we get is we keep this constraint, this one right here, so everything to the left of it, but this one is reversed. So this one is reversed, 
this one keeps, and then this is the region that you're getting. Note that it's always constrained in the parameter space theta. Okay, and last but not least, we have the third constraint, where you can see the same thing again. The third constraint is reversed, the first and the second constraint are kept, and this is all constrained in the parameter space, and then this is the region you end up with. Okay, now it's clear immediately that with this strategy you guarantee the complete exploration of the parameter space. But there's uh, one main issue, and the one main issue, aside from numerics regarding the fact that saying greater than instead of greater or equal means that we have to somehow deal with tolerances, um, is that we this creates artificial critical cuts. Ar artificial cuts. What that means is, suppose you're here, right, and you look at this region. Now imagine the critical region that you get from solving this problem does not have this shape but is bigger than this. For instance, goes all the way to here. Okay, so it comes from here, down, 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 up, up. Okay, then because we only though look in this region, it will have to be divided into two or th even three regions. Now this might seem like little and for a small 2x2 two two problem this in fact is feasible. But for anything remotely bigger than that, this is not possible and this explodes dramatically in terms of number of regions which is not necessary. And this means that we have a very high computational burden and this means that this algorithm is not computationally feasible. Okay. Now the second evolution, the second iteration of this was that uh, the, the algorithm that was done by Mato Bautic in 2002 and this was in a technical report. Okay, this was actually never published, which is interesting uh, in terms of in a journal. Because this is actually the most efficient, computationally speaking, geometrical algorithm there exists. Now, the way this is done is, so we get our point and we get our region, okay? As we said before, this is exactly the same, CR0. Okay, but then what we do, and this is the, cru uh, the, the crucial part, we locate the center of the facet. Okay, so for each facet of the critical region, we locate its center, and the way this is located by solving a linear programming problem. Okay, now you locate this, and then you step out of it. Now this is exaggerated here in order to clar clarify the point, but you step up uh, outside of it just enough to beat the uh, numerical tolerance, because again you have to be greater uh, than the constraint, not greater or equal. Okay, so you step s outside of it. Okay, and then you do the same thing, so you solve the um, either the KKT equations parametrically uh, for an active set or you solve the basic sensitivity theorem, doesn't matter. But you get the region and note here that there is no parametric, uh, no artificial cuts. So if you remember the previous uh, partitioning, which, um, which, which would have, for instance, cut this out into three pieces, now we don't have this. So we have one region, this is very nice, very nice and easy, okay? And the next one, uh, then we locate an another point on the facet, step out again, get another region, and so on, and so forth. Okay, and so this is the uh, this is this is the way you explore it. Now, this is a very efficient algorithm. Okay, so this works very very well. And in fact, in the pop toolbox, for instance, this is implemented also. I believe in the MPT toolbox, it's the same algorithm is implemented. So. This is very efficient. It's to date the, only the most efficient geometrical algorithm there exists. The main issue here is something that is called a facet-to-facet -facet property. And if you look through the papers, this is something that you also come across quite often, which is um, a way to say, and we have this actually here, uh, a small, uh, mo small picture, is that if this is your polytope and this is your facet, okay, the facet-to-facet -facet property means that the entire facet of one polytope is equal to the facet of another polytope. So if we look at our example here, for instance, for CR3 and CR0, this facet is, they share this facet, which means that it's a facet for CR3 and CR0. However, if we look at CR, uh, CR1, for instance, and CR0 and CR2, they have this facet right here for CR1, which however is shared by CR2, 0, and 3. Okay? So this, in fact, does not fulfill the facet to facet property. And when it doesn't, it can be shown that then it doesn't guarantee the full exploration of the parameter space. And that means 
that when you have those cases, uh, you can't uh, guarantee uh, the that you get all the regions, which means your algorithm might not be complete. Okay. And now, last but not least, we have the uh, final algorithm, the last algorithm that was uh, sorry, the second to last algorithm. There's two more coming, so this one and another one is Tundaletta, which was done in 2003. And the basic idea is it's actually a completely different route than the previous algorithm, although it has the same limitation, because Let's look at this, okay? This is an uh, image as you might see it in many um, parts of um, critical regions and so on. Um, let's say this is our CR0 and we have a certain active set I, okay? Which means 1, 3, 5, whatever. The idea of that paper, which is very powerful, is that based on this active set, and based on where this constraint comes from, and this constraint comes from, we can infer, we can I understand what the active set of the adjacent region will be. So there has nothing to do with step sizes or nothing to do with reversal of constraint. The simple idea, and it's, it's a very beautiful idea, is we take this active set, we look what generates this constraint, whether it's an optimality constraint, so lambda of theta greater or equal than zero, or whether it's a feasibility constraint, which means um, that the, the, the fe a feasible uh, point changes. And based on this, we can get, get that if this is based on feasibility, which means that a constraint is violated at this point, then we add this constraint to the active set. If, on the other hand, there's an optimality constraint, which means the optimality a constraint ceases to be optimal, it's taken out of the active set. And this is and this is proven in the paper that this in fact holds. Now the caveat of this, as you might already be seeing, is that this only holds if the facet to facet property holds. So you can understand this very straightforward in a very straightforward manner. Like this is one constraint, right? This is exactly one. But then if you the facet to facet property does not hold, then we have two regions here. Okay? And so it can't be that they have the same active set. That's not possible. So there must be different active sets. But if there's different active set, how can you infer this? Okay. And so this is this is the basic the basic nuance and the the way. In fact, if you look at the paper, you can find in it the condition for the facet to facet property. So this holds if and only if on the constraint itself there is no degeneracy. Okay. So if maximum exactly n constraint are active on this on the facet itself then you can say this in one condition where this for instance not met is where mplp problems because then on every facet you have n plus one constraints active and in that case the facet to facet property does not hold uh not necessarily hold okay and so that's um uh, that's the limitation of that algorithm which again does not guarantee that the entire parameter space is explored. Okay, and now finally, we come to the last algorithm, which was done by Spiotwald in 2006, Spiotwald et al., um, which again uh, is based on this facet to facet property. Now it even has it in its name on the facet to facet property of solutions of convex parametric quadratic programs. And what the paper says essentially is that if the facet to facet property holds, let's just use turn the letter. Okay, let's infer the active set, and this is great. This is this is exactly what we need because we don't have to do anything with step sizes and so on. However, if this is not the case, if we know from the conditions, from the conditions at the at the constraint that the face of the facet property is not guaranteed to hold, what we do is we create a slab of thickness epsilon. So this this red box here. Okay, so basically we just reverse the constraint just a little bit. And 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 create this this kind of slab here, okay. And within the slab itself, we use Bemporat et al. to get the active sets of the region. And then those, so for instance, we know that here there's a small partitioning, here's a small partitioning, and so on. But we don't calculate; we just get the active set. And once we get those, we remove the slab and we use these active sets to generate the full regions without artificial cuts. Okay. So this is this is the idea. The problem with this is, and as you might already guess, is this epsilon. 
because getting this epsilon quote unquote right and numerically stable is very difficult and to my knowledge at least there is no implementation of this available uh, for download and testing so so it's it's a beautiful algorithm but it hasn't doesn't have the same uh, let's say uh, it has some numerical issues in this case now this is was just a quick story for uh, the geometrical algorithm for MPLP and MPQP problems if you have any uh, ideas comments criticisms whatever let me know in the comment section um, and as I said the um, uh, al algorithm by Bautich the variable step size approach is what we have also implemented in pop so if you want to play around with that feel free to download the toolbox and let me know how it goes. Thank you very much.